Hi there, I'm Ray, and this is The Kitchen. In episode four, we talked about baking essentials. What are the ingredients that I keep on hand that would be great for you to keep on hand that would cover the bases for majority of the basic things that you can bake? So today, to follow up on last week's episode, which was cooking essentials, the pots, pans, utensils, and other miscellaneous items that are helpful to have in your kitchen to help you make dishes. Today, we are going to be talking about the essential pots, pans, and utensils that I keep in my home for baking. So, let's head into the kitchen and talk about it. So last week, if you listened to episode five, I wasn't in the pod closet. I was on the pod couch and I think the audio turned out relatively well. So today I'm neither in the pod closet nor on the pod couch. I'm in the pod vehicle (laughs) and it just happens. Life happens and I'm not at home, but I needed to get a podcast recorded for you guys because I'm dedicated to you guys. Thanks for hanging in there if you're listening. And so I, I'm hearing a lot of birds outside and every once in a while there's a plane. And so if you hear any birds chirping or planes flying by overhead, it might be me. It might not be you. So I hope you don't mind. Just think of it as a little bit of an ambiance for (laughs) today's episode. It has nothing to do with baking, neither birds nor airplanes, but we work with what we have. So to start, if you listen to episode five, which was last week's episode about cooking essentials, a lot of what I use for cooking are the same cookware, bakeware, that I use for baking. So it's really awesome that our pots and pans can be so versatile. So you don't have to have 20 different things for baking and 20 different things for cooking. So Let's get into it, starting with pots. I have a medium saucepan and a medium Dutch oven. So you, like baking, some people are pretty basic when it comes to baking things, and that's okay. So think like cookies and maybe cupcakes. Um, But a saucepan and a Dutch oven can actually come in handy. So when I'm baking, um, maybe you're making a jam. And so you need to cook down the sugar and some water and some fruit in a saucepan. Or just this last week, I made lemon zucchini bread, which recipe will be on the YouTube channel coming up as of when this podcast is published. It'll be the following weekend. I made a lemon zucchini bread and I made a lemon glaze that I poured over the top of the bread. And so I had sugar and lemon juice in my saucepan and I just cooked that until the sugar was broken down and I had my lemon glaze. Um, But what else? So you can use a saucepan to create a double boiler. Now if you're not familiar with what a double boiler is, it's basically like you have two saucepans and one sits on top of the other And in the bottom saucepan, you have water. And then there's a little bit of space between the top of the water and the saucepan that's sitting on top of that. And it's a way to gently melt chocolate, typically. Like, you can do other stuff in a double boiler, but I strictly use mine for melting chocolate right now. So, if you don't have a literal double boiler, you don't need to go out and buy one of those. What you can do is you take your saucepan and you take either a glass or a metal bowl and you can set that on top of your saucepan so it's kind of resting within the top rim of your saucepan and you have water underneath and then you heat up your water so that it's warm and it steams the bottom of your bowl that's on top and there you can gently melt your chocolate in the bowl on top of your saucepan. So... 
you may not do baking that requires a double boiler. So the saucepan may not be super necessary for you, but I'm sure you're going to have a saucepan in your kitchen for cooking. So just know that it can be handy for baking as well. Another thing, I know a lot of people melt butter in their microwave. You could just melt butter in your saucepan as well. A lot of recipes do call for melted butter when it comes to baking. And then my Dutch oven, two, well, two basic things that I use it for when it comes to baking. One is bread. I, I like to make the quick, no need artisan Dutch oven bread recipes. So my Dutch oven gets used for making bread, but also I like this Dutch apple pie recipe, but since I'm not the biggest pie person, I'm more of a crisp or crumble person or cobbler person, I've tweaked the Dutch apple pie recipe to be a Dutch apple crisp, and I will just bake it in my Dutch oven. So I have all of my apples cut up and seasoned, and then I have my crumble made, and I sprinkle that on top, and I just put my Dutch oven right into my actual oven. So I'm sure there are a lot of, if you like crisp, crisps, crumble, <laughs> crisps, crumbles, and cobblers, a Dutch oven could come in handy in a pinch. Now let's move on to pans. If you're baking, a lot of times people are going to be baking cookies at some point and so having either a cookie sheet or a baking sheet will be a necessity for you. So my understanding is that cookie sheets are flat and they don't have an edge. Some of them might have a lip on one side and I think that might just be to assist you in grabbing the pan out of the oven and then baking sheets actually have an edge all the way around like maybe a centimeter to a half inch tall depending on your baking sheet but that's my understanding of what the difference is between cookie sheet and a baking sheet the baking sheet has the edge all the way around if i'm wrong hit me up on the social medias and let me know um, but of course you use it for baking cookies a baking sheet if you have one that's like deep enough like some people will make um cakes like sheets of cakes so you might have like ooh, have you guys ever eaten or seen or made like I just, are they called pinwheels or like a log like a I've made a chocolate peppermint like log cake so it it was you make a thin layer of chocolate cake so in a baking pan, because the edge the edge of the baking pan is short compared to a cookie sh uh, compared to a cake pan. So a thin layer of chocolate cake, and then I made Cool Whip, and then I believe I needed peppermint oil, and then there are crushed up candy canes mixed into the Cool Whip or the whipped cream, and then spread the peppermint whipped cream on top of the cooled thin layer of chocolate cake and then gently rolled it and so it was a peppermint log delicious so not only might your baking sheet be used for cookies but also a thin layer of cake for a dessert log lots of uses for a baking sheet if you made like homemade crescent rolls or homemade breadsticks or something like that definitely you'd have a cookie sheet to bake those on. Some bread recipes are freeform bread recipes, so they're not baked in a Dutch oven. They're not baked in a bread pan. You just kind of form a shape on out of your dough and you put it on a baking sheet and you cook it right there. Those are the main things that I can think of that you'd use a baking sheet for, um, but if there's more, we can talk about it. Let me know. Next up is a muffin tin. So there are like regular size muffin tins that are about the same size as like a normal cupcake. And then you, you have your mini muffin tins and then you have your jumbo muffin tins that you would get. Um, like think of a muffin from a bakery or a cafe. They're usually really big muffins. Um, 
you can always get the big ones, you can always get the little ones, but I think the the regular size is the essential to have in your house because you can make muffins, you can make cupcakes. They're good portion size. Some of my favorite muffins are like an oatmeal chocolate chip muffin or peanut butter banana muffin, maybe carrot and apple muffin. I'm sure you guys have your favorites that you like. But um, think of when you buy like a muffin mix at the grocery store. Actually, it's been a while since I've purchased a muffin mix at the store. I'm thinking they probably have directions for like mini muffin tins, like with the temperature and how long to bake them. But when I'm making muffins, I'm usually making just the regular size. And I think all of the boxed muffin mixes you're going to get at the store are the directions are going to be for the regular size muffin tins. So it's very handy. Your recipes most of the time are going to be for that size. And then we have bread pans. Now I think like the typical bread pan size is like an eight inch by five inch bread pan. So a lot of like bread recipes think of like dessert recipe or sweet bread recipes. I think a lot of the recipes from my experience have called for the eight by five bread pans. Now, I don't have an 8x5 bread pan. It would be really handy if I did. <laughs> but I just have the, the little bread pans. They're like 5.75 inches by 3 inches. Or something something very close to that. Um, and so the downfall of me having the mini ones is that, like, it, like with the muffins, most of my bread recipes that I use have directions for the 8 by 5 sized bread pan. And so since I'm using the smaller ones, I have to watch how long the bread goes in for. Um, so having an 8 by 5 or having two 8 by 5s would be really handy if you know you're going to be baking breads. If you want to be baking like sandwich bread that you're going to be eating every day, you want the larger slices of bread, they do make larger loaf pans and so you'd definitely be able to pick those up but when it comes to like sweet breads like I said the 8x5 is a very traditional size now you may not think of this pan when you think of baking some of you might I don't usually um but a cast iron frying pan so you're like what the heck am I going to be baking in my cast iron frying pan well I can think of a few things. So have you ever had a Dutch baby? Um, it reminds me of a popover. So you can have, I'm sure you can have a savory one too, but I've had them for breakfast and it's a really simple mixture. I think it's like egg, milk, and flour. And there might be a little bit of baking powder, baking soda, maybe a pinch of salt. I don't know. I've never made one myself, but I've had one made for me. And so it's almost like a flat pancake and then you can serve it with like butter and jam or maybe some fresh fruit on it. Um, and that is made in a cast iron pan. But I'm also sure you've probably, there's a good chance that you've seen on like social media, whether it be Pinterest or Facebook or wherever, like skillet cookies or some restaurants have skillet cookies as a dessert. And so you can make a massive skillet cookie <laughs> or a skillet cobbler. So I've never made a skillet cookie. I've never made a skillet cobbler, but I've definitely seen them. So the skillet cookie, I think you just make your cookie dough and you press it into your cast iron and then you bake it in your oven. But the skillet cobbler... You guys will have to let me know. I wonder if you start it on the stove and then you put, you start your berry mix on the stove and then you put your crumble on top and then you bake it. Or is it just like a regular cobbler where you assemble it all in your pan and then you just put it right in the oven? I don't know, but it's very handy and it's rustic and it kind of just, there's a bird on the roof of the car. Guys, we're recording a podcast. 
<laughs> you guys might not even be able to hear that. But, yes, baking in cast iron. I'm sure there are some rolls that you can make in a cast iron. Cornbread can be made in the cast iron pan. So, for those, if you know you're going to be making stuff in your cast iron, same with my my cast iron that I use majority of the time for cooking. Mine is a 10 inch pan. So I would go on the medium, medium to large size for a cast iron if you just want one. If you're just trying to keep your kitchen cookware, bakeware inventory to a minimum, go for a medium large size. That's the same thing with my saucepan, my Dutch oven, and my baking sheet. It's nice to have extra room and not need it than not have enough room and need it. All right. So most cobblers, instead of being made in a cast iron, are oftentimes made in a 9 by 13 baking pan or casserole dish. So I'm just going to lump these together. The 9 inch by 13 inch, the 8 by 8, and the 9 by 9. I have all three of those, but I don't need an 8 by 8 and a 9 by 9. I just happen to have both. Some recipes, whether it be for bars, basically bars, <laughs> um, for if you're baking bars, say lemon bars, say brownies, maybe rhubarb bars, maybe Rice Krispies treats, lots, so many options. The amount of options, the, think of cookies, all the different types of cookies can basically be made in bar form. So your recipe for bars is either going to ask you to bake it in an 8x8, eight eight, a 9x9, nine nine, or a 9x13. Nine and when it, between an 8x8 eight eight and a 9x9, nine nine, if the recipe says in 8x8 eight eight, but you have a 9x9, nine nine, just use the 9x9. Nine nine. It might cook a smidge faster, so keep your eye on it. And vice versa, if it tells you to bake your bars or your brownies in a 9x9, nine nine, but you only have an 8x8, eight eight, that's okay. Use your 8x8. Eight eight. Your bars will just be a little thicker, so they may take a little bit longer to bake through. So just keep your eye on it again. Um, but super versatile. So I recommend the 9x13 and either the 8x8 eight eight or the 9x9 nine nine baking pan or casserole dish. What's the difference? I think casserole dishes are a little prettier and they tend to maybe be like ceramic or I'm thinking of the one my mom has. It might be, is it stoneware? No. I don't know the names of all the materials, but it's like this white ceramic material. It's not glass and it's not metal. That's all I can tell you. I can't think of the word. Anywho, let us move on to utensils. So a wooden spoon, doesn't matter if it's square or round. I prefer round. I think it's easier to like scrape out bowls. A silicone spatula. I prefer silicone just because it's, it can stand high heats. So if you are um, making some sort of cream or custard or sauce or jam in, a, in your saucepan, it can, it can stand the heat of being on the pan. Again, so could the wooden spoon. The wooden spoon can withhold, um, can withstand the heat. And then I ha I put on my list a pancake flipper. These will either be plastic or silicone. I think mine are plastic. Um, I know people who have the silicone ones. It doesn't matter when it comes to like flipping pancakes because it's not on the heated surface for too long. But I was considering whether or not I needed to put a pancake flipper on this list. Pancakes, when you're making pancakes, are you cooking or are you baking? I almost think of baking because they tend to be sweeter. But what if you're making like a savory potato pancake? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it, whether you consider it cooking or baking, a pancake flipper, pretty essential. And in a pinch, they can be used to get bars out of a pan. Even though a pancake flipper is wider than maybe you cut your bars, but if your pancake flipper is too wide, I also recommend having metal spatulas because they tend to be thinner 
and they're good for um, getting out a bar or a brownie or something out of your baking pan. And then a whisk. Whisks, most of the time, I use, well, you don't need a whisk, okay? You don't need a whisk. It's just, it's really good at doing the jobs that it was made for. So, like, when you're mixing together dry ingredients for cakes, cookies, bars, uh, breads, etc., it's really good at just evenly distributing your baking powder, your baking soda, your salt, any spices, maybe yeast. It's really good at just distributing those things throughout your flour. But also it's good if you are making a sauce or you are making a glaze in your saucepan. It's really good at breaking up any like sugar solids that you have in there. And it just, a whisk is a good catalyst for getting everything nice and smooth. And then of course, measuring cups and measuring spoons. Baking is considered a science, so a lot of the times it's really important to get your measurements exact. So um, most basic measuring cup kits, sets, baking cup sets, or sorry, measuring cup sets will come with a one cup, a third, we'll start off, (laughs) a one cup, a half cup, a one third cup, and a one quarter cup. So basic sets will have four cups and then a basic set of measuring spoons will have a tablespoon, a teaspoon, a half teaspoon, and a quarter teaspoon. Some will come with an eighth teaspoon as well for the basic sets of measuring spoons, but you can get really in-depth measuring spoon sets where there's like eight different measuring spoons. Um, But all you you can get away with just the four. Um, And then things that you're bound to have in your kitchen regardless are your spoons, your knives, and your forks, just your dinner dinner set Um, because forks can be used as a whisk. Uh, Spoons can just be used to mix uh, smaller bowls of things or for taste testing. Knives can be used to cut butter into flour or cut butter into a mixture for a crumble topping or you can a lot just the basic spoon fork and knife can just be used across your kitchen on so many different things the only thing I have to say again like I said in the cooking necessities episode don't use your metal utensils on nonstick cookware or bakeware some recipes for, for example, bread or muffins will say to use a knife to get between the bread or the muffin in the pan and just kind of scrape your knife around the edge to get it out, help get it out. If you're going to do that, I recommend using like a silicone or a plastic utensil because the metal is thin And if you're using a butter knife, it does have the one sharper edge and there's a chance that that could cut or scrape or scratch the nonstick surface. And then it defeats the purpose of the pan being nonstick because once you scratch the nonstick surface, it can't heal itself. And so that section is going to no longer be nonstick. It's going to be stick. It's going to be a stick surface. (laughs) And so... Just refrain from using metal on non-stick surfaces as much as you can handle it. (laughs) As much as you can do your best not to do that. Um, Instead, you could use, if you have a skinny silicone spatula, that'd be awesome. I have a skinny silicone spatula, and it's really handy for, like, smaller jars. But this could be an example where it would be useful. Just my two cents. Um, And then your regular kitchen knives... I recommend having at least, at the very least, three knives. Your chef's knife, a serrated knife, and a paring knife. So some baking recipes you're going to be dealing with fruits or vegetables. Um, Just last weekend, I needed my chef's knife. Well, I didn't need it. I used my chef's knife to dice up some rhubarb that I had that I was going to be freezing. 
Um, so I needed my chef's knife to cut up the rhubarb or if you are cutting up say apples or some other fruit for a pie or a crisp or if you need to cube up some cold butter to make your pie crust or something of course your butter knife could do that no problem um but if you're going to be cooking or baking you're going to have some cooking some knives in your kitchen so that kind of goes without saying but we kind of forget about having knives sometimes but if you're baking i'm sure you have knives don't let me ramble on about knives we have them if you don't have go get some And my episode one talks about the three knives I think everyone should have and what they're good for cutting. So let's move on to some of the miscellaneous stuff. This thing I had on my utensils list, but to me, it's it's not really a utensil. It's just a tool, is a can opener. So you may not think of having a can or using, well, it depends. It really depends on what you tend to bake when you bake. Things I open while baking that require a can opener. Sometimes I need it for my sweetened condensed milk. Now, some sweetened condensed milk will have a pull tab, but not all of them. And then maybe like canned pie filling or pumpkin puree. Those are just a few things that I know I've encountered or like, I don't know if I've ever, I don't think I've ever made anything with canned pie filling, but I've looked at them and you'll need a can opener for that. So a can opener is a pretty basic essential across the board, but I just, I had to mention it. Then we have cutting boards. Again, when it comes to cutting your fruit, your rhubarb, your apples, what be it, you got to cut them on something and that's what cutting boards are made for. But then we have uh, foil and parchment. So I am a big fan of easy cleanup. But also, if you are gifting your baked goods or you're bringing them somewhere, foil and parchment are nice to have. Parchment is more my go-to. So I'll line my bread pans with parchment. I'll line my cookie sheet with parchment. When I bake my bread in my Dutch oven, I'll, well, my recipe calls for parchment. Just all around easy to clean up. And then foil keeps its shape a lot better, so... It can be really nice to have around if you made like a sweet bread and you just want to kind of package it up a little bit and like bring it over to the next door neighbor or bring it to work to share with your coworkers or bring it to a friend to share whatever you want to do with it. Um, and then in the same vein is cupcake liners, cupcake liners, muffin liners. I use them all the time in my muffin tin. Easy cleanup. Uh, You don't have to worry about getting all the edges and all the corners of the round muffin designated area. Um, It's just really tedious to grease a muffin pan. So cupcake liners are awesome. You can get paper ones. You can get uh, foil ones. You can even get silicone ones that you can reuse, which is awesome. Especially if you're... I mean, why not? If you make muffins or cupcakes on a regular basis and especially if they're like just for you at home like say you make some oatmeal muffins for on-the-go breakfast or snacks you can use the silicone ones I don't have any but I think those would be awesome to have but it'd also be good to have some paper or foil ones if you're making muffins or cupcakes to take to a birthday party then you don't have to worry about someone stealing or throwing away your silicone muffin liners. So it might be good to have both on hand. Again, it depends on what you're baking. Then Ziploc bags. Now, yes, Ziploc bags are awesome for storage, but when it comes to the baking itself, if you are icing something or you're frosting something, um, you're decorating like a cake or a cupcake or cookies, and you don't have piping bags, Ziploc bags work in a pinch. You just make up your frosting or your icing, and then you roll down the top of your Ziploc bag. You put in your icing or frosting right into the Ziploc. You roll the top of the bag back up, and then you cut off the corner of 
your Ziploc bag, and then you have instant, instant piping bag, instant icing bag. Again, I do this maybe once or twice a year. I don't bake a lot of things that I have to ice or decorate very precisely, but there's every once in a while where having like a sandwich size Ziploc bag that I can just toss when I'm done, it's nice to have. Piping bags are great. I just, I don't want to spend the money on that when I don't need to use it. When I'm only doing it once or twice a year. But to each their own. If you're using it a lot, piping bags with different fun piping tips might be a lot of fun for you. And then a wire rack. When we're baking things, it's hot when it comes out of the oven. And most of the time when we get it out of the oven, it's done cooking. But there's still heat within the cake or whatnot. And we're ready for it to stop cooking. So putting it on a wire rack just helps the airflow get underneath the pan and it helps the bars or the brownies or whatever cool all around 360 degree cooling do i have a wire rack i don't crazy i know and (laughs) if you guys have seen me make cookies on my youtube channel at all you'll know i do something funky with my cookies once I get them out of the oven because I only have one baking sheet so I have to put my cookies somewhere so I can do the next batch. So what I grew up with was we got paper bags, paper grocery bags, um, and we would cut them open, cut the bottom off, and cut down like one of the corners or just make a cut down the side and then turn it inside out and flatten it and lay it on the counter And we would take all of the cookies that were baked and put them right on the paper bag. And I don't know if this was something that just my parents started or if it was passed down from their parents or how we came to do that. But I think, and I'll tell you the reason I think this, I think part of it is that the paper bag kind of absorbs some of the extra grease from the cookies. Now, cookies aren't meant to be good for you. They're dessert. They're a treat. But when you would pick a cookie up off of the paper bag, there's that little grease circle underneath it. So, get a wire rack. If you don't, if you don't have a wire rack, cut up inside open <laughs> paper bag. <laughs> Works in a pinch. Now, that doesn't solve the problem of like helping cool like a bread or a cake. So a wire rack is nice to have. You don't need it, but it can be nice to have. And you can get wire racks that they're pretty flat, so it's pretty easy to store them. The only thing is they're kind of a pain to wash. Unless you stick them in the dishwasher, then that's no problem. But that is my miscellaneous things that I think are necessities. And then I want to just throw in some bonus things that I don't think you need for a majority of baking, depending on what you're baking. So for me, these aren't things that you need, but are nice to have. So a double boiler, like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, if you have a saucepan and either a glass or a metal bowl, probably you could even use a dinner bowl if it's big enough that it won't fall right into your saucepan. A double boiler, for melting chocolate or whatever. Cake pans. I do not have cake pans. Think of like round traditional like birthday cake cake pans. Uh, They're usually like maybe eight inches in diameter and a couple inches deep. They're super easy to get. They're super easy to store. They normally stack within each other. Um, I just don't make cakes very often and if I do I can just use my square baking pans but if you know you're going to be baking cakes for, say, your uh, someone's birthday, your parents, your spouse, your kiddos, your friend's birthday, get yourself some cake pans. And if you like cheesecake, you might want to pick up a springform pan. So you ha- there's like a flat circular bottom part of the pan. And then there's a ring that's 
two or three inches deep and it has a clasp on the outside that when it's open it kind of it gives the ring I don't know maybe two inches of space and then you can close the clasp and it brings the ring tighter and so for your cheesecake you can make your crust whether it be like a graham cracker crust and you so you have the ring and you have the clasp closed and it's set on top of the flat bottom pan and you put your crust on the inside whatever kind of cheesecake crust you got going on and then you make your cheesecake filling whether it be like a new york cheesecake whatever you're fancy whatever you fancy and you put that on top of your crust within your springform pan and then i don't know whatever you put on top if you're putting something on top and then you either bake it or you let it set up I don't make cheesecakes, so I don't know exactly how all cheesecakes work. So if I say something wrong, please have mercy on me. But then once your cheesecake is baked, set up, cooled, whatever it needs to do, you can't just like flip the cheesecake out. So you unclasp the ring and you can just like, you might have to like wiggle it off of the edge of your cheesecake, but then you can just lift the ring out. And then you have your cheesecake unharmed on a flat, on the flat bottom that you still have it on. And so now you can just easily cut it, scoop out a piece, and it still looks pretty. And then this one for me is a necessity, but it might not be a necessity for you. And it is a cookie scoop. So old school, old school way to ball up cookie dough you can do it with your hands you can do it with two spoons but what if you've never seen a cookie scoop it looks like a smaller version of an ice cream scoop there's either the one thumb press or you can squeeze both sides of it and it's just like this dome and you scoop up your dough and then you either press the thumb lever or you squeeze both sides of it and it ejects this perfectly domed ball of cookie dough or you can use it for making like, I use it for making Oreo truffles or Oreo balls also, but it's not a necessity. You can get it in all different sizes though. You can get it in like teaspoon size, tablespoon size, quarter cup size, tons of different sizes. And my dad always says, oh, those are too perfect. They're going to look, <laughs> they look store-bought. And I'm like, no, no, I like how they look. That perfection, just that they're like all the same size and shape is very satisfying to me and your hands get less dirty and it takes a lot less time than taking the two spoons and balling up your dough again it's not a necessity it's just I know I enjoy having cookie scoops and if you make a lot of cookies on a regular basis you might already have a cookie scoop but if you don't or if you want to start baking cookies and you have a few bucks to spare, a cookie scoop is a nice addition to your to your kitchen gadget collection. And then a microplane, I don't use mine very often, but if I'm making like lemon or lime or orange, anything citrusy that I know I'm going to be zesting, getting the zest off of the peel, or if you're making something ginger and you're using fresh ginger, you're going to have to grate your ginger. So a microplane or you can get specific like fruit zesters that are just like they have a handle and you just scrape the zest off of the lemon for example it can come in handy but if you have a cheese grater most cheese graters have um a section that has really small grates on it and that can be used to zest a lemon lime orange so if you have that on your cheese grater, there's no need to go run out and just get a microplane. And then a rolling pin. Now, I don't have a rolling pin, but I have an empty wine bottle. And that's what I use if I need to like roll out a pie crust or something. So if you have some, if you have a rolling pin, awesome. Glass, wood, marble, whatever you're, whatever you like. But I... 
I don't know why I don't have a desire to have a rolling pin. I think because I hardly ever use it. So when I do need to use some sort of thing that mimics, that does the job of a rolling pin, I just grab this empty wine bottle that I keep on top of my fridge and it does the trick. Rolling pins are a little more ergonomical because they have, most of them have handles or they have a place to put both of your hands on, on it. Whereas the wine bottle, there's only one neck on the wine bottle, so you're kind of winging it with your other hand when you're rolling out your pie crust or what, whatever it may be. And then I don't have, I don't have a hand mixer and I don't have a stand mixer. That might blow some people's minds because a lot of recipes, like cookie recipes, call for you to cream together your butter and your sugar. That can be done with a wooden spoon or a spatula. It just takes a lot longer to do. And it takes a lot longer to get some of that air into the butter and the sugar. That easily happens with a hand mixer or a stand mixer. But I get by without the hand mixer or the stand mixer. A mixer can make your life a lot easier. I'll leave that up to you if you have a hand mixer or a stand mixer or you want one. By all means... Don't let your dreams be dreams, but you don't need them. So I've been trying to think while I've been going over this list with you guys, if I've missed anything, I'm trying to picture my, my cupboards and my utensil holder. I think I have everything. I'm thinking of like serving things. If you're a big pie person, like I said, a lot of this is subjective to what you are to what you are going to be baking or you know you like to bake. So I don't eat a lot of pie, but if you do like pie and you're going to be cooking a lot of pie, you might want a pie server. So if you've never seen a pie server, it's in the shape of a triangle. So and it's specific to getting a pie, a piece of pie out, getting a piece of cheesecake out because you're cutting up a circular shape. And so you cut into the middle and out to the edge and you cut yourself. Also cake. Oh my goodness, I forgot cake. You can tell I don't make circular desserts very often. So a pie server can be awesome. Again, you don't need it. You can get by with a fork or a knife. But a pie server can be really handy to have. Um, Let's think. So serving platters. Again, you don't need them. Like, I serve a lot of my desserts right out of the pans they come in. But also, like, if you're baking a bread or a sweet bread, I almost always utilize, like, my 9 by 9 baking pan if I'm taking it somewhere. So, my bread is done, it's cooled, I cut it, and then I store it in my baking pans because they have lids. So, having casserole dishes or baking pans... Or and your pots, it's always nice to have ones that come with lids because you can also use them as a storage container. Chances are at some point you're gonna have leftovers <laughs> of your desserts. So like I said, your baking pans, maybe some Ziplocs, maybe some Tupperware. This may be a common sense, it might be common sense to you guys, it might be a no-brainer, but sometimes we forget about it and especially if you're new to baking, you're new to the kitchen, I still want to share it because there might be one person out there who's like, oh yeah, maybe I didn't, I wouldn't, I might not have thought about that. So if it helps one person, it's worth me mentioning. Oh, yes. Sorry. I missed one thing. Cake testers or toothpicks. You don't need them because you can use a butter knife. So a cake tester is basically like mm, five four or five inch long like skinny piece of metal and then it has like maybe a plastic thing on top that you can hold on to it's a really lightweight really small little device that I grew up with like my mom had a couple and you use them to just poke the middle of your cake or your brownies or your sweet bread and then you test to see is there still wet batter on it or did it come out clean? And so it helps you know if you need to keep cooking your bread, your brownie, your bars, whatever. If you don't have one of those, toothpicks work in a pinch. 
And if you don't have either, if you don't have either of those, or I made what did I make? Oh, I made baked oatmeal a couple weeks ago, and I wanted to test it, but the baked oatmeal was deeper than my toothpick was tall. So I used, I think it was my baked oatmeal. Anyway, whatever I baked was too deep. So I just grabbed a butter knife and I stuck my butter knife straight down into the middle. And then you can see if there's any wet batter left on your toothpick, your cake tester, your butter knife. And if there is still wet batter, stick it back in the oven and let it keep baking for a little bit. And then I think one last thing, going back up to measuring cups, you don't need it. But I recommend having at least a two cup measuring cup. And it's really nice to be measuring like larger volumes of like fruit or larger volumes of liquids. And it can be nice to have one that's glass so that you can microwave if needed. And they tend to have like a little pour spout on the one side so it's easier to pour your liquid if it's liquid pour liquids into a mixing bowl or whatever. So not necessary, but it can be really handy having a larger measuring cup. You can get them inside in like two cups, four cups, and probably even like six cups. So I have a two cup glass measuring cup and I find it very handy. Um, Sorry to be jumping around, but to the electric gadgets, it can be handy to have either a blender, a food processor, or an immersion blender on hand. If you're going to be making something that has like a crust on it, or maybe you're making biscuits, a food processor can be really handy to cut the butter into your flour mixture. Now again, this can be done by hand 100% but it can be a time saver, it can be a hand saver, like a wrist arms saver, because there's a a little bit of elbow grease that you need sometimes, like cutting butter into your flour mixture. You don't need that. Most of the time, you don't need electric gadgets. Don't get me wrong, they can be fun. And there are so many kitchen gadgets out there that I didn't even touch upon. I'm sure there might be some that I'm even forgetting, There might be some that you use all the time that I didn't even mention. And if there are, I'll leave my social medias listed down below. Hit me up and tell me, tell me the stuff that you, the tools, the pots, the pans that you use in the kitchen regularly, they're must have for you that I didn't mention because I'd love to hear about it. I love, it's so fun for me to go on go into a store that has kitchen gadgets or go online and see all the different kitchen gadgets. I can just scroll through all the pictures and be like, oh wow, that'd be so nifty. But I just don't have room in my kitchen. (laughs) So let me go back over everything I mentioned real quick, just in summary. A medium saucepan and a medium to large Dutch oven. Uh, Medium to large baking sheet or cookie sheet. If you're going to pick one, I recommend a baking sheet over a cookie sheet. A muffin tin. I do a 12. A 12 muffin muffin tin. Medium, the regular size, the medium size. Not the the little baby ones, not the jumbo bakery ones, just the regular medium size. Bread pans, I say get two 8x5s. Or, I mean, that's going to be easiest. I have the smaller ones. You can get bigger ones, but... 8 by 5s are going to be the most common. A cast iron pan, like I said, mine's a 10 inch. Again, you don't need it, but if you have one, you might use it. That's it. Out of all the pans I listed, the cast iron isn't necessary. I just happen to have it, and you can use it for a lot of things too, aside from savory cooking. And then in a 9 by 13 casserole dish or baking pan, whatever material you want to use, glass, metal, ceramic, and then either an 8x8 or a 9x9. You can have both if you want, but one or the other will be just fine. And then utensils, a wooden spoon, a silicone spatula, two silicone spatulas would be better, but one will do the trick, a pancake flipper, 
plastic or silicone, a metal spatula, great for serving bars, brownies, etc. Measuring cups and measuring spoons, a two cup or larger measuring cup, again, not necessary, but can be handy, a whisk, again, not necessary, but can be handy. It's really good at doing the job it's intended for. Uh, your typical food prep knives, a chef's knife, a serrated knife, a paring knife, um, your typical dinner spoon, fork, and knife. And then on to miscellaneous, we have a can opener, a cutting board or two, foil, parchment, cupcake liners if you're going to be making cupcakes and muffins. Again, you don't need parchment. You don't need cupcake liners. You can just butter or oil or spray your pan. Some recipes will say to butter and flour a pan. That will work in a pinch. I just prefer the easy cleanup of parchment or foil. Ziploc bags, not necessary, but can be handy for icing or frosting, but also storage. And then toothpicks, maybe a cake tester. And then a wire rack for cooling. Like I said, I use paper bags for my cookies, but a wire rack would be handy for me to get for cooling like sweet breads or regular bread. And then some bonus items, a double boiler, cake pans. You can get square cake pans too if you don't want round ones. There are square ones. A springform pan. Awesome if you're a cheesecake person. Oh, a pie plate. If you're going to be making pies, pie plate is a good idea. I don't have one. <laughs> you can get metal ones. You can get glass ones. You can get really pretty. You can get really pretty, um, like, pottery pie plates. Don't get me started. Um, and then a cookie scoop, which is an essential for me, but it can be really handy for you. Makes life a little easier when, it, when you're scooping out. Dozen done, dozens and dozens worth of cookie dough balls. A microplane. Again, if you have a cheese grater, you probably have the little grates section that could be used to get zest off of a lemon peel, off of a lemon, and then a rolling pin, maybe a wine bottle, maybe another circular alcohol bottle. And then you might already have a hand mixer and a stand mixer. And I feel like I was just about to say something. What were we talking about? I don't know. There's a lot of other stuff out there that I don't have that I didn't mention, but I wanted to give you guys basics that will get you through baking a lot of things. I mentioned a handful of things that I don't even have in my kitchen, um, but like I said, it depends on what you know you like to bake or you want to bake. Like, I'm not a big pie person. Like, the last pie I made was a peanut butter pie. Delicious. Recipe is over on my YouTube channel. And it calls for an Oreo crust. Now, I could have made an Oreo crust, but I'd have to get a pie plate to put the Oreo crust in. So, what I did was I just purchased the Oreo crust pre-made from the store and made my, my pie in there. So, if they're just going to be like one-time uses... You can get a whole bunch of different shapes and sizes of aluminum one-time use baking pans, pie pans at the grocery store. And if it's just a one-time thing, just pick up pick up one and you're good to go. You don't have to clutter up your kitchen. You don't have to worry about taking it somewhere and you forgetting it or someone accidentally taking your pan. Nothing wrong with getting a one-time use aluminum pan from the store. Works in a pinch. So I think what I'm going to do for you guys is I'm going to try and include links in the show notes and if you're listening on YouTube down in the description for you guys to, I'll link them to either the products that I do have, the cookware and the utensils that I do have, or ones that are very similar um, so that you guys can go take a look if you're in the market for any of these things. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to be linking any, what is it, La Crusade, any super expensive things because I know I didn't spend buku bucks on, I don't think, anything in my kitchen. So, oh my goodness, safety first. Hot pads, don't forget hot pads or oven mitts. You're going to be taking hot things 
out of the oven. So hot pads and oven mitts. Almost forgot. Glad I remembered. Could sneak that one right in there. Back to what I was saying. I'm going to try and leave links down below for you guys. Um, if you're in the market for anything, you can check out like what styles of utensils and cookware that I use. So that's all for today. Like I said, if I missed anything, if you want to share anything with me, if you have any suggestions on things you want me to talk about, if you like what I'm doing, if you don't like what I'm doing, if you want, if there are things that I could be doing better, uh, you can rate and review the show on Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening, you should be able to rate and review. Um, leave me a comment if you're listening on YouTube. You can, if you would prefer to critique me directly, I'll leave my social media down below for you guys to reach out to me directly. Um, but I'm going to leave you guys with this per usual that Jesus loves you. He wants a relationship with you. You do have a purpose on this earth. And me as a Jesus follower, it's hard sometimes to want to do everything for myself. But my purpose on this earth is to glorify God and be an ambassador for Christ. So that is why I tell you about Jesus. Because he loves me and he saved me. And I want that same thing for you. Life's not always easy, but he is why I have hope. And so no matter what goes on in the world, I know there's hope. So I'll leave a passage of scripture down below for you guys to check out if you feel led to go read that. And thank you all for listening. If you made it this far, thank you all. <laughs> uh, all right. We'll talk next week, everyone.